Should I start here? Yes, please. Start yes. earlier. Susilo from Indonesia. Good morning, everyone. Actually, it's not a question, just for to share something. Talking about education, I think it's kind of old, ancient, famous, and unsolvable problem. Because why? Education is the root of the problem. So if education is being solved, I think there's no poverty, there's no problem in health, there's no the other's problem. So why I can call it as unsolvable problem? If it can be solved, there's no government. There's no use of us to care with the other. What we can underline here, the main, uh, the main, the main root of problem of the education is about the awareness. There will be no uh, what we can do here. Not erase the problem of education. What we can do now is just minimize the problem of the education. So what we can do now is how to aware with the environment how we can we can not uh, we are not selfish we are not just um, thinking about our ego but how we can care with the other because with the with the awareness uh, with the awareness we can we can uh, the, if there's technology we can spread with the other with the awareness we, we can share our experience, we can motivate the others. I also um, establish, establish a program named in my, in my local, local sets called Awong Chili. So it can call as a um, social program for the poorer. And the most uh, that I can underline for my, for, my, yeah, for, my, for my program is about motivation. All of the students actually they want to, yeah, of course they they want. Uh, <laughs> thank you for. All right, like ten seconds. Finish yeah. your take. Hey, Motivation is the most important thing that we can spread with the other to solve the problem of education. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. That, actually, that, that was a blog post, not a tweet, Pete. <laughs> Hundred and forty characters next time, huh? <laughs> Um, so, next up we have a question from Zoe from the U.S. of A. Good morning, everyone. Um, something that seemed to be repeated is the notion of education as a human right and education as sort of an inalienable right that we all have. And one of the biggest concerns that um, the survey showed the biggest um, sort of opponent of literacy is corruption and poor governance. So I was just sort of you know, wondering how we might come up with ideas to hold leaders more accountable, to hold leaders to their pledge, to the constitutional promise to education that a lot of people in developing countries do have. So that was the only comment that I had. It's a great question and you should get together a bunch of like-minded people and come back with the answer. Where are we? Fatima. Hi, this is Pedro from Colombia. I, I, hey, cry, I cry every time I hear the story of Malala. It really breaks my heart. There was an interview where they asked her if she has any rights in it as a child, and she says, I have the right to play, I have the right to go to school, and she was 12 years old, and I think it's just heartbreaking that they would shoot her for her. My yeah. question is, the mullahs in Pakistan have refused to condemn the Taliban and they've taken to Twitter the Taliban to attack journalists and media. What can we do to help Malala and what we can do to help Pakistan? <laughs> it's heartbreaking, so, so I... Yeah, I great just, question. I just want to ask. James. Hi, we've got a delegate here from the US. It's Jamari Peterson. Yes, hello, good day. Um, my question is, especially given the discussion of education literacy, I would like to hear more, I heard it was a question, about the role of financial literacy and how that is being approached, especially in collaboration with computer literacy. Um, because I personally believe every dollar matters, um, no matter where you are. So um, in, the, in this whole area of education, I was kind of, I didn't hear anybody kind of speak about that aspect of things. So I know it was, I know it was reading literacy, but... That was my no, kind of financial question. is a very important point. And I think when the councillors come back up on stage, if you want to address any of these questions specifically, please do. Elio. With Karuna from Mauritius. 
returning ambassador. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Hi. Um, this is a comment. We talked about literacy and even computer literacy, but I want to add another one, which is environmental or sustainability literacy. Behavioral change is one of our biggest challenges to achieve sustainability. We therefore need education for sustainable development to equip individuals with sufficient scientific, ecological, and ethical knowledge needed to build a sustainability based culture. I therefore urge every one of you here to lobby your governments for education for sustainable development. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Pete, we got, a, we got a comment from Shudi from India. Thank you so much. So we've been talking quite a lot about education today and we have limited the word literacy to just reading and writing words. But I feel that it should be broadened to encompass the personality, the attitude part of an individual, which means that every, every citizen in the world, not just a country, has some responsibility towards the society. So which is called a social responsibility. And it is definitely not a service that some person takes up if he or she is teaching 10 more people, 10 underprivileged children in the country. It's not a service that you're doing or a sacrifice or any great work. It's just the responsibility that you hold towards the globe that you're, you're being a part of this community. So we should probably emphasize also about educating people about taking up social responsibility that, which is a fundamental work of every individual. So, yeah, thank you. Excellent. And now one of Pittsburgh's own, Rachel. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so happy you're here, and I'm happy you're in my city. Um, I think education is such an important tenet of our human condition, and I think accessibility is a huge issue. I'm a disability rights advocate in Pennsylvania, and I work specifically with youth who have mental health disabilities. I also have a psychiatric condition, and I think often we are told, you can't, like Joss Stone said, and we shouldn't believe in you can't, we need to believe in a world of you can. We need to spread our hope, we need to share the light, and teach people that education is a way out, education is a way to pave a better future for yourself, for your friends, for your family, for your community, and as global citizens, we need to respect diversity. Disability is diversity, and diversity is a beautiful thing. Thank okay. you. James. Well, we go from someone from Pittsburgh to someone from Johannesburg, which is where, of course, we're all going to <laughs> next year. Um, we've been talking about education, how to support it, and to do so from South Africa has a great idea. Well, I think uh, let's firstly change the way we actually uh, think about education. And how we can actually do that is that education can't be solved in isolation. Education is a number of factors. There's issues of accessibility. There's issues of actually paying teachers well. And there's an issues of actually training the teachers well. There's issues of poverty. So I wanted to actually change the way we think about education and stop actually thinking about it and resolving it in isolation. It's such a mere comment. Thank you very much. Hello. A fellow delegate, but from Cape Town, South Africa, not Joburg, so no Malubi. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Just to add on what's being said on education and coming up with a revolution on what's being currently um, used in the education system, I would just like to add that if we could come up with a way to measure one's ability other than the convention of writing tests, that would be very awesome because I, speaking from experience, tend not to do well when it comes to tests and everything. But then when I find when it comes to actually applying what I've been taught and everything, I actually do way better than the 98 students and A students that, do, that sit in classes and do actually well in coming up with tests and everything. Pete. Got a comment from Isaiah from Nigeria. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd also like to say that one of the most important aspects of education is the content of our curriculum. Right now, I believe that the content of our curriculum cannot combat the problem of our generation. So we should go, uh, uh, go for our government, talk to our curriculum developers, talk to the media to develop a new content that can tackle the problem of this generation. Until, and until young people rise to the challenge, I don't think the content of our curriculum will change. 
So we should try as much as possible as young people from our local communities to the national level and across the borders, try to develop a new content in our curriculum that can combat the problem of HIV, AIDS, malaria, environmental sustainability, and other aspects and other challenges that affect our world. That's enough. Uh, Michelle from Canada has a question. Hi. So, um, I've been involved with some movements as well, and um, I know that finding volunteers is often a huge uh, barrier to starting a movement. So I'm wondering if throughout this summit, if people could maybe share their experiences with finding more volunteers, that would be awesome. James? Uh, we have with us now uh, Khorshid Abmejan. Yes. And when I asked him where he was from, he didn't say Pakistan. He said he's from the country of Malala. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Khurshid Ahmad Jan. I am from the country of Malala, Yusuf Zai. Uh, uh, my friend Pradero just talked about Malala, Yusuf Zai. And I remember last year, we were uh, talking about Mukhtar Amai. He's a, a really nice man. And I once again thank you that you discussed here again. Uh, my dear friend, not only you are crying, we all are crying for her. And I really cried when I saw this news first time in Pakistan. And uh, I, I, I am very much thankful to the Pakistani TV channels, print media and social media for the last 10 days or more. There are so many news and uh, uh, everyone covered about Malala Yousafzai. What I want to discuss here is Malala was brave enough to manage to go to school. What about rest of the other girls who are facing problems to go to the school. And here, uh, my delegates discuss about computer literacy. But those girls even don't have access to the schools. And computer literacy is a very far behind thing. So we have to think about all those. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Elio. Aisha, again from South Africa. Hi, everyone. Um, some great speeches and great initiatives. Um, I would just like to give a quick comment. Um, I think uh, education has always been linked to a lot of other issues, such as um, poverty, lack of access, lack of teachers, uh, especially in places like Africa. So I think what we need to start thinking about is sustainable platforms for education um, to bring the massive revolution that um, continents like Africa do need, we need to create platforms that can run themselves as well once we uh, move back and um, potentially move on to other issues and um, things in the world. Um, so we need to start uh, looking at it. Um, we need to incorporate the technology into these sustainable platforms to really create the change. Thank you. No, I think it's a great point. I mean, I think, you know, you will see across each of the different sessions, there are lots of different themes we're going to go through. On one level, you can end up sitting there going, there are so many issues to fix in the world. Where do you start? I think the thing to do is choose the thing you're passionate about. If it's within literacy, which is the area of literacy you're passionate about? And just really focus on going and doing one thing on that or connecting with like-minded people and doing one thing on that. And if everybody does that, then a huge number of positive things are going to happen. Pete. Uh, we have a comment from Kasim from Guinea. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for choosing me. Well, I have a comment to make. Specifically, it will be in terms of education and computer literacy. Obviously, I'm originally from Guinea, but I was born in Sierra Leone. For most of you, you might know the blood diamond, what happened. That's how I migrated in Guinea. And I was one of the lucky ones who had the chance actually to travel all over the world. I now live in America. I did my uh, undergrad here. But just on a quick note, yes, it is good to talk about education. And as many sub-Saharan Africa, we had independence for 50 years now. And we still obviously look up to Europe or the developed world to help us. The main problem is uh, those leaders, because at the end of the day, even two days ago, I was reading the Wall Street Journal where IMF and World Bank, they've been giving money to those leaders. but. We all know those leaders are taking that money back to America or some Swiss bank. Obviously, the money is not reaching them. We can talk about education a million times, 
but implementing those because when you have all those different charities, you're giving it back to the president or the, educa the minister of education to run those things. Ultimately, they will pass it over to their uh, sons. And if you go, I had the chance to go to one of the best schools here in America. If you look around, most of those schools, all the Africans who are there, they are either the son of the prime minister or minister of finance or whomever you call it, where they get those money from. And they're not even living on the scholarship. They probably on, they get, they're paying $50,000. How can you pay $50,000 you making, if based on your salary, you should be making $1,000? Or maybe the GDP per capita is just $200. So come on, when you implement, when you're using those money implemented, you have to empower. Education or movement doesn't start from the top down, it starts from bottom yeah, up. Agreed. So that's my call. Fatima. Uh, we've had questions and we've had comments, but now Gladys from South Africa has a challenge for all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And as you can see, we are ready. South Africa is ready. We're ready. And um, almost everybody's from South Africa that is asking. <laughs> you go, South Africans. Um, I would just like to challenge Africans, and especially South Africans, because um, with our history, we uh, are sitting in a position where we're saying, you know, give education or literacy to the previously disadvantaged. Um, but my point is we actually... At disadvantaging even further, we're disadvantaging them even more because yes, we get scholarships to go to university and try and study further, but the first time you see your computer is at university and this lecturer is like, uh, please uh, enter the system, log on, here's your log on information. It's like, what? I've seen this on TV. So my challenge to all the South Africans is we can stand here and we can say how uh, education is now taken further. I'm not even going to start about uh, computer literacy because we still have students or kids studying under the trees. Let us take it further. Let us take it to those kids that have never seen a computer and let us get them to be empowered. It's good enough to sit in the cities and say, you know what, uh, we previously disadvantaged, now I've got an office, I've got a corner office, but what about those kids that are still disadvantaged? What are we gonna do when we get out of here? I challenge you guys to form a group and to get that to change. James. Fatima, I'm here behind you. Oh, we have okay. a question for you from oh. Pierre from South Africa. I have a question directly for Fatima. I also work in written media. Media is phenomenally powerful at changing the world through attitudes and education. But the market demands to consume rubbish and will pay handsomely for it. So I just wanted to ask, how can media balance or take responsibility for its power but while remaining profitable? Mm -hmm. Good question. Do we answer that now? Or yeah, yeah, if you want to. <laughs> If you need some time to think, I can fire a question over here. <laughs> well, I think the, the question has to be about content, not about profit. And it sounds obnoxious to say that, and I know we're supposed to be entrepreneurs and we're all supposed to care about this kind of stuff. But look at this issue with Malala. Look at the stories that have been put out there. And I haven't heard one bit of context behind them. So the Taliban attacked Malala because they said she promoted Western thinking when she asked for school. But actually, what Malala was promoting was Islamic thinking, because liberty for women and empowerment for women is a central part of Islam. And, and I haven't seen one newspaper or one blog or one anything that has pointed this out. That's one way that we can defend Malala, that's one way in which we can protect her, is to point out facts rather than just fears. And it's compassion again. We have to return to that over everything else. Great answer. Um, Elio. Anshuman from India. Uh, guys, I'm going to be uh, the note of discord in the whole uh, discussion so far. The discussion has been primarily focused around uh, computer education and how it can make uh, education accessible for all. But my question is that uh, 
when a lot of people don't have computer, even if they have a computer, they don't have electricity to run it. If they have an electricity, it's either too high at a voltage which will probably melt the computer, or uh, uh, too low a voltage that the screen won't glow, then how, how, edu how computer education is going to help us? Uh, for a field such as health, which is so essential for a kid to survive, you know, a simple fact such as using soap can save the life of millions across the world. But we know this, a small kid in a rural countryside in India does not know that. Unless and until that fact is included in his college book, in the curriculum of that particular school, uh, where he's studying about wars and uh, you know what Napoleon Bonaparte did, but not uh, what he can do to survive uh, the next year, uh, we are not going to change anything. So education is about making people aware of the rights and the benefits that they, they have, and not probably about what's happening in US. So that's my view of it. Just a, just a brief intervention. Um, any of you that are going out to go to the loo, yeah, come back because we'll be going to the vote on the pledge. So don't go out and stay out, come back, okay? Any of you going out now when you see the others that have gone to the loo, say come back so you come back for the vote, okay? Yes? Please. Yes? Great, we've got a comment from uh, Nina from right here in Pittsburgh. Thank you very much. As you know, Pittsburgh's not a very big city, so what we have to do here is collaborate, and I haven't heard that yet. So I have four words, make, break, hack, and share. So where is the collaboration through empowerment, through all these wonderful, amazing am ambassadors? Where is the counterpart to your lower income community? Where are they as beyond, thinking about them beyond just have and have nots, but the haves as resources? and instilling them an empowerment to be agents of their own change. I'm, I'm an educator and I work for the Girls Math and Science Partnership at the Science Center and I also have a startup nonprofit for art and technology in a very low income neighborhood here. And without collaboration, without things like our Kids and Creativity Network, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. And I'd like to ask you to think about where are you making your sustainable learners, as in lifelong learners, and um, also where, you know, how do you use open source technology but as an ideology? We can move beyond bits and bytes, but our particles are just as open source as everything else. Fatima. Um, Huma from Karachi has a couple of short comments. I'll try to keep it short. Um, I was listening to the discussion and what really made me happy was to see poverty and corruption on the second slide because that's something that's very relevant to developing countries. And unless we address that, we can't exactly tackle the education problem. So I think as individuals here, we need to also play a role in getting education to people but also in challenging our governments to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, the comment that someone made over there about the utilization of funds that the government gets on education and passing it on to people who are illiterate rather than providing higher education for your own, um, it's something that I feel really strongly about. So that's one. Um, the second one is, in a developing country like Pakistan, you can educate an illiterate kid, but what is the future that you're offering them after you educate them? So along with primary education, I think it's very important to focus on vocational education also. So as to give them a future that they can actually earn a livelihood and not be unemployed. Um, the third comment is the role of higher educational institutions in not only educating uh, their students, but also educating them to become responsible citizens that are aware of the issues that the country sort of is tackling. And making them sort of do internships with NGOs in the summer program instead of just corporations. Those were three comments. Excellent. James? David, uh, we're here to talk about education. And so we have Elizabeth, who is a teacher in a village in southern Kenya. And she's also the founder of an organization to promote girls' education. Excellent. Elizabeth. OK, thank you. In, uh, okay, in education, we find that there are some challenges which are not being taken into consideration. 
especially sex education. In Africa, sex education is like a taboo. We find that parents don't get the opportunity to talk with their children about sex. And in other countries, sex education is not integrated into the syllabus. So this we find as a really a big challenge. So as youth, I would like to urge you people, if you get the opportunity to talk to other people about sex education, especially from the age of 15 to below. Then another challenge we find that uh, in African countries, we find that we're being led with leaders. Our leaders are semi-illiterate or our leaders, most of the leaders are semi-illiterate or uh, uneducated. And most of them hold very important posts in the government. So we have the leaders are like, the, I mean the youth are like, if our leader is not, education, uh, is not educated, why should I go to school? So you find that this is a really a big challenge to the young people. So as uh, the youths who are here and you have the power to, to, how can I say it? You have the power to influence others. If you find that in your country there is a leader or there are leaders who are not educated, you have the power to talk to your governments and tell them we need educated people to stand for us. That's the point I want to give you out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Elizabeth, I just, I just wanted to quickly reaffirm some things that she mentioned over there. First of all, I mean, as an AIDS activist myself, I think it's essential that sex education needs to be integrated fully into the school curriculum, but that education needs to start off at home. People always ask, ask me one question, what can I do for my community? I say, go back home, go and speak to your child about sex. And they say always the same thing, especially in Asia. Well, it's not part of our culture. Hmm. I say this. If you don't speak to them about it, they're going to learn about it from their friends who also don't know about sex. So you can either be embarrassed or you can help give your children the tools which to live not just a healthy life, but a good one too. Um, just, I think just so, just so we don't have to cut people off and upset them now, okay? The people who are standing at the mics, that's it. Those are the ones who are going to speak. Don't add to the queue because I will come and, b and ask you to sit down, okay? Now, well, we each, also need them to be short because... each person at the mic, yeah, under a minute. Each person at the mic, under a minute, okay? Because the people won't get their turn, okay? No adding to the queues, councillors. Don't let extra people join the queue, okay? <laughs> All right. Rebecca? Hello? Rebecca from Washington. Related to one of the comments we just heard, um, in an ideal world where all the amazing charities and initiatives and organizations about education are successful, the world would clearly be a better place. But I think throughout the conference, we also need to ask ourselves about what happens when all the aspirations we've built up, when we've achieved an education, disappear. Um, in my family, I grew up being told that going to college was the key to a successful life. And I got in, and I did it, and I graduated, and the economy tanked um, about a month later. And so I'd like to see throughout the conference that when we're thinking through educational initiatives, we also ask, how can we shape a world that has opportunities for young people when they've completed their education to go on and get good jobs and lead fulfilling lives? Pete. Hey, got a comment from Ollie from Croydon in the United Kingdom. who wants to speak about uh, education without ideology. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the delegate speakers for your talk earlier. Keeping this short, I just wanted to talk about education. So it would be wonderful if we can go around the world and educate people. But in many parts of the world, now in the future, education will be wrapped in ideology. An ideology good, an ideology bad. So let's say, for example, in the West, there are people who are educated but spout hate. They make us think that other people are different because they think different to us. I ask the delegates, I ask everyone here about can we work towards a future with education with liberty, where education is free and not wrapped in baggage. Thank you very Thank much. You. Fatima. This is Frank from Costa Rica. Hi. Well, actually, you have a common and then a challenge for us. And I think that something that we have in country yet and is really important is actually the roles of teachers, right? We are never going to change education or bring computers if the teachers are not ready to use it and actually 
to show the students how to use it. And that's, that was the challenge that I want to let you know, that we must be teachers. It's our responsibility to teach what we are learning right here, to show to the new generation all the knowledge, but especially to share our vision of the world so they can embrace it, they can live it, they make it on their own, and actually they can change the world for us. Thank you. James. I still remember last year, I don't know if he's here this year, but last year one of the most special moments for me was introducing a former child soldier from Uganda. And I'm so happy Thanks. to introduce you to Asma, who's from Afghanistan, because she, like him, has had an incredible journey just to be here, just to make it here in Pittsburgh as the only female delegate from her country. She says she's very proud to be here, but we're very proud to have her. And she's going to talk about coming from a country where about 89% of the population are illiterate, which is why she says they're joining organizations like the Taliban and losing their sense of self. First, I want to say good morning to everyone. I'm feeling very proud and happy that I am joining such a summit that here is all intelligent youths, and I'm really happy to hear because it was very difficult for me to join such a uh, summit because, as you know, that our country is male-dominated country, and it was really hard to come here. I want to say thank you very much for my sponsor, which my company has sponsored me. I'm really happy. Thank you so much. I'm very excited. I cannot express my feelings, so I'm just, <laughs> I'm very happy. I have my own projects. We, are, we have an association. We're providing literacy to the women because most of the Afghan women are illiterate. Day by day, they are joining the Taliban groups. They are working against the government, and they are blast themselves on the streets and everywhere. And I'm providing literacy classes to the women. When they become literate, they know how to write and count. We're providing vocational trainings that they can, uh, like they should know some skills. And we link these women to the microfinance and institution that they can uh, get small loans and start their uh, business and their community in order to have income and be self-sufficient. And I believe that as I read about the United States, they first start their countries with the small businesses. But I believe when we have a small business in our country that people should become enable and they have an income, they will never join the Taliban groups and they will have everything which they want. I want to say that thank you very much. But I have a question from my Indian friends, which he said that we should bring literacy through the, our internet. So in Afghanistan, 11% of people have uh, access to internet. What's your idea that we should, how we should bring literacy to the different communities, which is remote areas. They don't have even access to the uh, electricity. What is your idea? Thank you very much, and thanks a lot. Elliot, now we have about nine minutes of questions left. We have about 18 people standing up. So if you all do 30 seconds, we can get them all. And if not, we'll eat up all the time. No further introduction. This is Andrew yeah. from the United States. Hi. The thing that I took away most from just about everybody who spoke today was that education is the issue that will be the catalyst that will allow us to overcome many of the other grave issues that are facing our world today. Poverty, ignorance, disaffection, Education is the key to unraveling these problems. And I think no matter who you are when you go home from here, whether you're a government official, whether you're part of an NGO, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an activist, whether you're a student, every one of us should be prepared to do whatever it takes and should be able to do whatever works to ensure that education creates a world that has a spot for every person. Pete. Uh comment from Larry from right here in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to challenge all of the uh, delegates from the United States and mainly everybody to definitely focus and think of education um, in terms of a holistic approach. I think that in America we typically focus on exporting kids and everybody into the workforce, but we need to focus on 
bringing kids to focus on different issues within the community and incorporate civic engagement and service learning into our curriculum. And I think it, it applies to across the world. Um, I work with the Crawford County Juvenile Probation Services Office as well as teaching a course on aquaponics in a middle school at my college. And I think that incorporating service learning and all of those things within education is an, an important key to changing uh, the way we're doing things right now. Fatima, seven minutes to go. <laughs> Ammar from Saudi Arabia has a message after Larry's challenge. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Fatima. Uh, well, we all have seen the world and how the world has changed dramatically uh, through the past five uh, to six or seven years since Facebook has started and social media. Um, I think or I believe that uh, Education is not only about providing education at the first place, but also improving it, improving the current system of education, improving the entire education uh, equation, if I may say. So the quality of education is very important. So uh, I want to make sure that whoever here is working on the education system or who is responsible in any way, please, please provide good and, I don't know how to say this, but ethical education system. James. David, we have Coyote from Nigeria, and he has one challenge for us. Okay. My major challenge is on the quality of education. We focus a lot on people are, the number of people who are educated or uneducated. But what is not usually done is what is the quality of education people get. My observation is that most people are educated, but they kind of they're unemployable. So my challenge to everyone here, to the one young world family, is as we design projects and programs for education, to think about what the precise objective of education is. For me, it's employability, it's entrepreneurship. Let's think about these objectives and then design the programs with this in mind. Thank you. Elio. We have Maron from Eritrea who will address us uh, from a refugee uh, point of view. Good morning, everyone. Um, I speak on behalf of refugee. Um, for being as a refugee, the most thing that we look for is just education, more than shelter and food. And what we've been finding so difficult over these years is that uh, nation is not really um, approving our previous uh, education background or even um, trying to accept us into institutions to further our education. And the only hope of any refugee is that to keep that vision alive so, as education, one day that they can be back to their home country and to make the difference by getting the education that they get. Um, nationalists are not really willing to provide that and uh, they see as refugees as the second class people and we look forward to breaking that uh, kind of barrier. Thank you very much. Hey. Got a comment from Shamsuddin from Sudan. Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to give thanks to my sponsor who made me down here. I would like to talk about uh, sustainable education and development in Rwanda. Uh, all of us should say kudos to the sister, somebody who initiated a self-program to be able to develop education. But for me, I want to give you one to five points. Number one, I will start by saying, every one of us here, whenever we hear the name Rwanda, something sound in our mind. If you all know this, it is called genocide. So therefore, I want to urge Kate and Paul that every one of us should donate five five dollar each for one young world educational development project in Rwanda. Do, do one more point because we, we can't let you do all five. We haven't got time. Sorry. The next point, the last uh, the last point is to urge every delegate here to hold the Rwanda government, the United Nations, as well as African Union, that a strong sustainable educational project. From the, primary, from the primary education to university should be endowed by scholarship, by all means, for the genocide-affected students in Rwanda. Thank you. Fatima. And this is Sergio from Mexico. Good morning to everyone. Um, for, well, we've spoken a lot about what do we need education and all of the problems in our countries about education, but what, how are we going to act? And I want to tell you these two points. Uh, first of all, we need to commit and to make a good strategy to, 
to go back to our countries and to speak to governments to commit them to make improvements to our curricular. And second of all, and most important, I believe we all have to be teachers. Here we have a lot of great wisdom and knowledge that we can share to everybody. Let's not be selfish. Let's share all this knowledge. Let's be teachers of our, of our society. Thank you. James, we have another Mexican, Diego, and he wants to get back to what Sujit brought up in his speech earlier. Uh, hi, Sujit. Um, you were telling us that you were, you were asking us for our, help, for, for our help in your Facebook campaign. I would like to know how the Facebook campaign will translate into people reading more, because you, you told us, I need your help in December. I want to know how will this translate in people learning to read. Thank right, you. you answer, answer that at the break. So we have what we can only do one more question from each mic. And apologies, Elio. We have Simon, the future Prime Minister of Samoa. Fatsa lo fatsu ilmo malumon pa iyo la langi wa ofia malolo soi fomo malolo langi mama malolo sa idi malolo. Now, no one would understand that, right? No one would understand that because I'm Samoan from the Pacific Islands. And what I haven't heard today is the importance of indigenous languages, especially for nations who migrate and who are living in the diaspora. It's important that we include and encompass the definition of education, our languages. Our languages underpin our culture. Our culture underpins our identity. We lose our language. We lose our culture. We lose our identity. We are nothing. Thank you. Hey. We've got a, got a comment from Jackson from Toronto, Canada. Hello, everyone. So only 30 seconds, no time for long, dramatic pauses. But there is something that also has not been mentioned yet, which is what we are doing right now, which is dialogue. This is probably one of the greatest feedback loops any of us have ever had. We all need to bring that back to our communities. This is something that's called the youth or the student voice itself. And I think that as we all go back, we try to achieve you know, our own legacy within our communities. Each of those legacies needs to have an element of continuity. Whatever we're doing, whether it's establishing a policy for trying to legislate student representatives in our schools, in district school boards, that all needs to come back to establishing dialogue and showing that the future student leaders, the people who aren't here right now, have their time to make sure that they can achieve their own legacies. So my challenge to all of us is to include in our pledge, not just to emphasize literacy and technology and environmental sustainability and all these great things, but to emphasize the student voice itself. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, la last question from Fatima's mic. We un unfortunately can't get everyone else in. The last right. question is from Mohammed from the United Kingdom. Thank you. Actually, it's a comment. Whilst it is rightly the emphasis on education, literacy in the developing world, perhaps it's equally important to mention the growing inequality uh, in access to good quality secondary and higher education in the developed world. Uh, it is widely believe that uh, education and a good quality education is the single most important factor in reducing uh, poverty and uh, increasing social mobility. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then the final, final question from James. Funny how we come full circle, but Michelle was a child soldier in Congo and moved to Canada as a refugee. Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to echo a couple of things that were brought up, uh, first of all by Catherine and then uh, I forgot his name but he's from the Samoa. I think one of the things that I, I loved as an African was being taught stories from my grand great grandparents and for a challenge for all the African leaders who are working in education here is when you're creating framework for education within Africa, don't forget the stories that your grandparents taught you because that's your identity. I remember when I went to school in Uganda, I was being, when I spoke, my, when I spoke Swahili, I was beaten and told that Swahili was a terrible language and English was the best language to do. Why is the Eurocentric way of education only the best way? Why can't we combine both and actually make a better education for Africans? So. Thank you. James, I want to come back to the stage. So thank you uh, to the councillors. Would you, each of you, like to make a comment about something that you found provocative, interesting, answer a question? Pete. Sure. I guess I'm the, the, uh, the representative of the media. So I was interested in the media question. I think it's possible to make... I mean, obviously, the media is, as, as you might have noticed, 
especially the print media, in a struggle right now with regard to its business model. I mean, just this week, uh, Newsweek has said it's going out of print. Um, we'll be going all digital. And I think the future, though, for media is really bright. And the question was, was about, you know, if people just want to consume rubbish, how do we get them to really, to really engage with the real issues? And I think um, it's very possible to find uh, the angles and the way of approaching issues uh, that appeal to people emotionally. I think that's really the way media gets through to people. And we certainly find that we have a social good channel uh, on our site. And really the things that, it, that impact people are telling stories, are being very direct, are appealing to their, um, their humanity, and, and to, be, uh, to really tell great emotional stories and to connect with people. And I think people still care about that. And I think, you know, the future is very bright for media in the digital space, but it's obviously going through transition. Obviously, you know, new business models are being found. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to make a brief comment on the fact that uh, what I think we should retain from today is the level of energy and, and, and desire to make things happen as opposed to just what level in the education and literacy continuum that is. We heard about uh, financial literacy, we heard about computer literacy, we heard briefly about health literacy, somebody mentioned about the use of soap. Uh, we all know what water can do. All of these are degree of different things that starts with the very basic, you know, know how to read and count and then, you know, go up the continuum. Now, I think that what is very important is that all of you said, what can we do to start doing something about it? And I don't think that it should be an answer that is applicable to every country and to every uh, level. I think whatever you can do, as long as you move the, 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 the level one notch up, just go do that. You know, whatever is that movement important in that moment, whether it's in health, financial, you know, basic literacy, computer literacy or something, if you can participate to make that little one notch up, that's I think what we can all do and we can all do it tomorrow. James, um, I just want to get back to what Pete just said and also Fatima from the question about uh, low quality material in, uh, in the media today. I think that it's very much demand driven. So I think that if you continue to demand low quality material, that's what newspapers and uh, television stations are going to put out. I can definitely think that's true. How you can change that though, I was going to say you could write to editors of your local newspapers, but that's quite a slow way of doing it. I think it's even more powerful. You said, Fatima, that you hadn't read a single blog about Malala that talked about the Islamic way of thinking and to defend her and to defend her dignity and her integrity. So we have what, a thousand people in this room right now? If you all just wrote a couple of sentences on Twitter or on the blog, I already think that you're bringing about a change to the real landscape out there. Yeah. Hey, hey. Um, just one small point, and you know, it comes as we're talking about Malala, as we should be, but when we're looking at a country like Pakistan and, and a lot of other developing countries, we're looking at, in Pakistan at least, literacy rates that hover around 40%, and the only qualification for literacy is the ability to sign your name. Um, so that's an inflated figure. And so why don't we say education for everybody, not just girls, little boys, everyone? And it's, when did it become fashionable to single someone out? <laughs> Somebody gets left out of that equation. Um, and I'm sure all the Pakistani delegates will be able to attest to that. It's not just girls that are kept home. It's also young boys. Thanks. Okay. So um, let's have a round of applause for the delegates who shared their insights and experience. You can leave the stage, guys. Okay. And now it's time to vote.